Hello, my friends. Last week, we saw a shepherd that would leave 99 sheep to look for one. And we also saw and glimpsed into this parable of a woman that has lost one coin out of 10. And she scours and lights a candle, does everything she can to find that one coin. We saw, you guys, the intensity of looking because a sheep and a coin had been lost and the owner or the caretaker, the shepherd, the woman did everything in in the intensity to find that coin, to find that sheep. And in both stories, we saw incredible celebration. Well, I'm excited because today we are going to be looking at the story of the prodigal son and get another glimpse in how intense the Savior looks for you and for me. Now that is a reason to worship together. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb Desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. See 
Luke chapter 15. We're going to continue on here. But before I continue on in verse 11, I just want to reiterate once again, because it's important, the first couple verses. So let's start at verse 1 of chapter 15, and then we'll bump down to verses 11 and on. Chapter 15, verse 1. Now the tax collectors and sinners were all drawing near to hear him. And the Pharisees and the scribes grumbled, saying, This man receives sinners and he eats with them. Oh, you guys, right off the bat, there's so many incredible things here. First of all, the people or the ones that are far from God or the ones that the Pharisees think are far from God, they're the ones that have come to hear and they're drawing near. You can almost see it. And the Pharisees, they're grumbling because they can't believe that not only does he receive sinners, but in the Middle East thought here, in their culture, he's actually eating with them. So with that in mind, with the audience in mind, let's bump down to uh, 15 verse 11. And he said, there was a man who had two sons. The younger of them said to his father, father, give me the share of property that's coming to me. Give me my inheritance. So right off the bat, I want you to know that the way that he actually phrases this, father, give it to me. So he doesn't even use a a respectful way of addressing his dad. He's just pretty much commanding that he give him something. And not only that, in him asking at this point, he's pretty much proclaiming to his dad that I don't really care about you. In fact, I wish you were dead so I could get what's coming to me. There are so many thoughts that are swirling right now inside the people that are hearing this, including the dad and perhaps maybe even the older brother, maybe some servants. But we are going to watch at how the younger brother and the older brother and the dad or God responds to this request. Let's continue on. And he divided his property between them. So now he's taken all of his property and he's divided it between his sons. And now we're going to see in just a bit that the younger son liquidates everything and he takes off. And he has to do it fast because we have to remember the context in which we're reading this is the village knows what's going on. The village is invested in this family. So this guy has to liquidate fast and hit the road because he has brought shame on his father, shame on his family, and shame on the village. So not many days later, the younger son gathered all he had and he took a journey into a far country and there he squandered his property in reckless living. And when he had spent everything, a severe famine arose in that country and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to one of the citizens of that country who sent him into the fields to feed pigs. And he was longing to be fed with the pods that the pigs ate, and no one gave him anything. You guys, let's just pause there for a second and realize afresh that pigs and Jewish people do not mix. They do not mix. In fact, one commentator saying here, a commentator that actually grew up in the Middle East, he was saying that oftentimes uh, in the Palestinian background or in the Middle East background, people don't necessarily fire you, but they might give you a job that you'll hate it so much that you finally just retire or you resign from it. And he's wondering if that's even partly going on here because this guy is gluing himself, this younger son is gluing himself to an employer and the employer is going like, ah, and gives them this awful job. You guys, the young Man is so desperate that he is actually lusting or craving deeply what he's actually feeding the pigs. So he's desperate now. But when he came to himself, he said, how many of my father's hired servants have more than enough bread? But here I am, here I perish with hunger. I will arise and go to my father and I will say to him, father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I'm no longer worthy to be called your son. Treat me as one of your hired servants. You can almost see him rehearsing this in front of the mirror. Father, maybe poke himself in the eye so he's, he's crying a little bit. But here he's rehearsing because at this moment, you guys, he still not ha- he hasn't come to an end of himself. So here, he's been really a jerk at home. He's brought shame upon everybody. He liquidates everything. He blows it all. 
He's feeding pigs, but still, even though he has the lowest occupation in these days, the days of context here, he still has not come to an end of himself and he's making up excuses and he's making up ways that he can somehow pull himself out of this or save himself. He's still plotting. He's still plotting that somehow he can maybe get hired back by his dad and pay himself out of the debt that has incurred. But he still doesn't get it. He's burned bridges with the village. He's burned bridges with the family. He's brought shame upon them. The list goes on. In, in verse 20, and he arose and he came to his dad or his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and felt compassion. And he ran and embraced him and kissed him. And the son said to him, so let's just pause there for a second. Everything about this is just pretty crazy because the father, a man of dignity, he would not be running. In fact, you get this picture of this old man. He's watching and waiting for his son. And when he sees him, he should actually just sit there and wait for his, his um, son to come grovel because that would kind of be tradition. But no, not, what happens is he sees him and he actually grabs what he's wearing and he pulls it up a little bit so that he can actually start running. So now other people would not see just a dignified man. They would see a dad that is so intensely crazy for his son that he wants to envelop him. And the word here that he used and he embraced him and he kissed him means that he kissed him over and over and over again. He was so happy and got to remember, this guy's coming from a pig farm. So it seems to me that dad kind of likes him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father. I love this. Because here you still have this, I can save myself, self-righteousness. And you have these three little words in verse 22. But the father. Father. So incredible love comes and breaks through this whole facade. And while he's giving his excuse, but the father, but the father said to his servants, bring quickly the best robe and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet and bring the fat and fattened calf and kill it and let us eat and celebrate for the son, for the son, for this my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate. So here, just to give you another picture of this commentator that, that has lived in the Middle East for quite a while, he gave this picture too that oftentimes there may have been street kids, uh, kids that were getting into trouble. He even call, called them gangs. We see them even in in uh, church history or Bible history of these gangs of kids following after Elisha and mocking him, calling him, hey, Baldy, hey, Baldy. And finally, Elisha, in a very interesting story, uh, calls a curse upon them and bears come out and take care of the kids. Hmm. So don't mock, mock bald people. But nonetheless, he was saying that even within this culture, you would have gangs of kids that love to mock people that were down on their luck or people that were poor or people that had nothing, people that were on the streets. So if you can imagine, in verse 24, for this, my son was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. And they began to celebrate him. So here, all of a sudden, you have this picture from this commentator that there would have been people ready to stand up for the dad and the family, people ready to mock him, People ready to make fun of him. People ready to give this young guy a hard time. And they're watching the dad. And the dad had every right to stay put and to let his son suffer the consequences. Now his older brother was in the field. And as he came and drew near to the house, he heard music and dancing. And he called one of the servants. And at this point, the word that he used for servant that could have been uh, it could have been one of these possible mocking kids that was ready to mock the younger one. But now that they're all standing by and watching dad run and embrace his son, it's messing with everybody's narrative. 
And he called one of the, the kids or one of the servants and asked what these things meant. And he said, your brother has come and your dad has killed a fattened calf because he has received him back safe and sound. But he was angry and refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him. So even that, you guys, for the dad to have to come out from hosting a party, had to come out and entreat and beg his son to come in. There's just so many things that in tradition doesn't make sense. But here God is giving a picture. And you remember, he's talking to the Pharisees. He's talking to the people that love tradition. And he's showing them God's way. He's showing them the passion of Jesus for his lost sheep, for his lost sons and daughters. He was angry and he refused to go in. His father came out and entreated him, but he answered his father, look, these many years I've served you and I never disobeyed your command, yet you never gave me a young goat that I might celebrate with my friends. But then this son of yours, notice that, not my brother, this son of yours came who has devoured your property with prostitutes. You killed a fatted calf for him? So even in that, we get this whole story of what the prodigal did with all his money, but we actually get that from what the older brother said about him. And he said to him, son, you're always with me and all that is mine is yours. It was fitting to celebrate and to be glad for this, your brother was dead and is alive. He was lost and he is found. Now let's pause there for a second and go back to the beginning of our reading. You see that the people that were down and out, the sinners, the tax collectors, the, the nobodies, they were leaning into Jesus and hearing and listening. But the religious leaders, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees, they were angry and grumbling. How in the world could Jesus eat with these people? Do you see what's going on here? We have the wayward son and he goes far away and he needs God and he makes up all sorts of excuses. He does all sorts of things that he's running away. But then we see this lovely specimen of the perfect child and there he is sitting in the household but yet he too isn't really interested in the love of his father. He has a self-righteousness. His good deeds make him think that his father needs to love him. There's a transaction there. Somebody said the prodigal son's a great lesson, not only for sinners who recognize their need, but also for those who consider themselves sinless and who may harbor feelings of resentment because God is so merciful to those awfully lax and sinful ones, those guys over there. The targets of the story, Tim Keller says, are not wayward sinners, but actually religious people who do everything the Bible requires. Jesus is pleading not so much with immoral outsiders as with moral insiders. He wants to show them their blindness. He wants to show them their narrowness, their self-righteousness, and how these things are destroying both their own souls. Listen to this. It's destroying both their own souls and the lives of the people around them. It is a mistake then to think that Jesus tells this story primarily to assure younger brothers of his unconditional love. Because again, he's helping us see the Pharisees' reaction. To understand the significance of what even the younger brother is asking of the father here, it's interesting to see that the Greek word when he says that he actually splits up his stuff and he has to split up his property, the word used for property actually is a, a word of bios in Greek and actually means life. So it's kind of interesting. He's taking his livelihood and people are invested into this. And not only that, but there is even the shame that comes with this whole thought because they had built this for, for a long time. So you have this character, this reputation. In fact, when somebody from the Middle East would, in, would talk about themselves, they would just 
pretty much tell them what family they came from and what village they came from. There was a pride. There was an ownership. And yet here he says, I want that. I will, don't care about you, dad. I don't care if you're dead. I want this. I'd like to take your life. I'd like to take the livelihood of our family. The pride of our village and I'm going to squander it. The father patiently endures a tremendous loss of honor as well as the pain of rejected love. It's easy to get angry, don't you think? I know even in my own life, I have definitely felt rejected when I've stuck my neck out to love. And boy, when we get a glimpse of what the dad has done here, that the dad maintains an affection that the dad bears all of this agony. I think Tim Keller is right in that he talks about this incredible, tremendous loss of honor and the pain of rejected love, but how the father intensely looks for the loss. Let's take a couple minutes to look at our main characters in the story here. First of all, the prodigal son. Give me my inheritance, I wish you were dead. He liquidates his assets. He rejects his father's love. He brings shame on the family and the whole village. And there's this tradition that where the community would have, when he came back, when the prodigal son came back, there's this tradition that the village would have grabbed a pot and smashed it, showing their, their absolute disgust and that he is not welcome in the village anymore because he's brought shame upon his family and shame upon the village. In fact, the Greek word for journey, when he takes off on his journey, it's interesting because it actually means that he is traveling away from his own people. So just think about that for a second. So all of this pride, all of this identity wrapped up in a, in a village and in a family, and all this has, that has taken years to build up, he is ready to liquidate it and say, forget about it. And he no longer wants to associate with dad, with brother, with family, or with village. Well, there was traditions put in place that if that would happen and this guy would come back, they would smash this pot and say, you are no longer welcome here. You have to keep that in mind because this is also going through the young man's head when he realizes that he has no more money. He has no more friends. He has no more connections. He has no more stuff. But still, he has pride and self-righteousness. After all that, you know, my friends, doesn't it blow you away sometimes how low we can get but we still don't look up toward God? How often our elevator, you would think, has smashed to the ground floor, but we still hold on to whatever pride we can because we have to have dignity. We have to bring something to God. And I think this story is really showing us that we come to God empty-handed. You guys, he has burnt bridges in his community. He's burnt bridges in his community. He's brought shame. The prodigal son would have gladly eaten what he was feeding the pigs. In fact, the Greek word pretty much says that he had lust for what he was eating or what he was feeding the pigs. He had a huge craving to eat that. So we're talking this guy was starving. Okay, he was desperate, but still he had not come to an end of himself. Still he had not humbled himself. In fact, he had gone out to get a job because he has in mind that maybe he can be a blue collar worker so he can be useful for his dad's estate when he gets home. So the word that he used is it's a skilled craftsman because he wants to pay back his debt. You guys, this is incredible because you and I are no different. We think that we can pay back our debt for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God and the wages of sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. You guys, the sooner we realize that there's no way, there's nothing that you or I can do or say to get, and God goes, you know what? Wow, what was I thinking? No, 
because God loves you intensely. The father loves him intensely and the prodigal son had to come empty handed. He could not bring a skill. He was sought after because he was lost. He had to be bought back. He had to be redeemed. But yet he wanted to redeem himself. But you guys, he starts with his polished speech about, oh, I have sinned against, and I, yada, yada, yada. And then we come to those special words, but the father, but the dad. And the prodigal son cannot finish his speech. He cannot finish his speech. And somehow I think within this, these moments, he finally realizes the intensity of how his father was looking for him. He realizes the intensity of his dad's suffering. He realizes the sacrifice that his dad has made. And if you look at this, you guys, we're gonna see in just a bit that even when his dad ran out, all eyes went from the, the dirty, stinky, prodigal son. And as this old man pulled up his clothing and started running, and even, you know, it wasn't classy in those days to be able to even show your legs to, to, as an old man, there was dignity in all this. And all eyes went from this dirty, prodigal son, and all eyes went to the dad. All eyes went to the father. The dad takes his shame. Well, let's move on. The older brother. And the older brother, you guys, there's so many things within this that are cultural. Right at the beginning of the story when the younger brother is being a meathead, the older brother should have stepped in and at some point it should have shown that he was a mediator, that traditionally he should have stepped in and talked about, whoa, 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 what's going on here? and somehow been a mediator between this horrible situation that was going on. In fact, even when he left, you could have sh or could have and should have seen the older brother take some initiative in either saying bye to the guy or blessing or, or trying to work things out with the brother and with the dad. He should have pleaded for his younger brother to stay because he knows what this is going to do to the estate. He knows what this is going to do for the village and he knows the broken heart of his dad. But we don't see the older brother take his job seriously. And we also forget that right at the beginning of the story, we see that when the dad actually does split up the inheritance, he doesn't just give what's, uh, what's coming to the younger brother. He actually splits it up right there. So the older brother also gets his share. But yet, he's bitter and he's angry and doesn't seem to understand the love of his father. And it almost seems like he doesn't love his father, but it almost seems like he loves his own righteousness. He loves his own righteousness. And yet he points at the wild living of his younger brother. Meanwhile, he's sitting in his own filthy self-righteousness. Isaiah tells us this, our righteousness is like filthy rags. Keller says, uh, with the older brother, it is not his sins that create the barrier between him and his father. It's the pride he has in his moral record. It's not his wrongdoing or his self-righteousness but his self-righteousness that is keeping him from sharing in the feast of the father. You guys, again, they're throwing a party and the older brother looks in and he can't believe this is happening. He can't believe it. And here what Keller has pointed out is he has this pride in a moral record. He pretty much is doing things and keeping the law, thinking that, well, God or Father has no choice but to love me. He has to love me because I've kept the law. He has to love me because I haven't rebelled. So you have two sides of the coin here, a guy that goes off and does wild stuff and a guy that stays put, but in his heart, he's full of wild oats, shall we say. So 
So his self-righteousness is what's keeping him from sharing in the feast. His self-righteousness is keeping him from celebrating with the village, celebrating with the family, and celebrating that his brother was lost, but now is found. Now is found. Let's look at, look at the dad for a second. The dad raced toward his son, totally in an undignified manner, he ran because a dignified man, an older gentleman like this, full of wisdom, he would walk slow. He would walk slow. Traditionally, he would have stayed in his home subdued, expecting the son to come back and grovel and apologize because he had done something wrong. And like I said, there would have been these village kids probably ready to mock and make fun of him of this dirty prodigal. But now we see the compassion of the dad and the dad takes on his humiliation. The dad takes on the shame because as he runs, you can just imagine how crazy it would have looked for this old man full of dignity and respect to be running after his son, not caring how stinky and dirty he was, but embracing him and kissing him and kissing him and kissing him. And not only that, he puts, he says, he he commands everybody, not just where is that? best robe but servants please get the best robe and put it on my son get the ring it probably would have been a signet ring of the family and put shoes on his feet shoes on his feet because slaves often didn't have shoes and this guy is my son put shoes on his feet you guys this is incredible because the best robe would have been the dad's robe the ring probably would have been a signet ring which means that again he had power within the family and shoes Because identity was with the family, was with the father. This is such incredible stuff in this story. God the Father pursues us. And this is evident because he even sent Jesus Christ in the incarnation. He put on skin and he lived among us. And finally, we crucified him and he rose again. But you guys, it... This is incredible stuff because the same thing happened there. This dad took on the humiliation. This dad took on the shame. This dad pursued him. This dad had a big celebration. And the same thing happens with each and every one of us. Jesus Christ took your sin to the cross. He took the shame and he was humiliated for you and for me. We were rescued. Just like this son needed to be rescued. We come empty handed. And after this, the village also would receive the prodigal son. After this, the village also receives the prodigal son. You guys, I hope you're seeing this, that we have this wayward or prodigal son. And obviously, God has shown us through this story that the father has an incredible love and a pursuit, an intense desire to bring us back into the fold. He sent Christ to die on the cross for your sins and for mine. But if you're also identifying with the older older brother, I mean, he's talking to the Pharisees here, guys that think they're righteous, thinking that they have this righteousness that they don't need to be saved. And they're so wrong. They're so wrong. So oftentimes, you guys, we can get caught up in church affairs. We can get caught up in our own works. We can get caught up in our own resumes that we think that God would almost, God needs us. I mean, of course he loves me. And we might fall in love with serving. We might fall in love with church. We might fall in love with things of God, but we miss the person of God. We miss the person of God. Remember the audience? He's talking to the elders. He's talking to the Pharisees. And he's talking to the teachers of the law. And here we see the elder brother representing them. Not willing to celebrate. Not willing to celebrate. My friends, this can happen to us. Sometimes we have led a decent life. We've tried to keep moral guidelines, which is all good. 
But sometimes we think that's our resume of why God loves us. And then we look at bitterness toward people that have lived a crazy life. And then all of a sudden they're part of God's family and you go, what? This isn't fair. Yeah, well, grace and mercy isn't fair. But we all need it. We all need to experience the incredible, intense love of God through Jesus Christ. Folks, we all need Jesus. He is the one that changes hearts, but some of us get caught up in our own self-righteousness and we end up worshiping the things of God or like I said, worshiping our works or worshiping the church and we miss the whole point of the person of God. In fact, some of us, I would say, even try to control God by living so bad that we don't think he'd ever be interested in loving us or some of us try and keep so many morals or so many rules that we think that we can actually control God. He's got to love us. He has to love us. And in both scenarios, we need a savior. So my friends, I hope you take some time Uh, this afternoon or whenever you're listening to this to realize that oftentimes we fall into these camps that some of us think we're unforgivable that we've gone off in far places we have we have hurt so many people we have forsaken so many people we've betrayed so many relationships that were beyond forgiveness the prodigal son story is for you And my friends, if you have also made good decisions, you've hardly done anything disrespectful, you've stayed close to God, you've been reading your daily devotions, these are all good things. But we got to be careful of the spirit of Pharisaism. You guys, if you find yourself actually almost looking down or bitterly at people that have lived like hell and you're going like, what? Or if you, find, if you find yourself taking yourself too seriously and you can't really enjoy celebrating other people's victories, you may have a problem with Phariseeism. Today, I want you to know that Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of those sins. The sins of the prodigal and the sins of the religious. The sins of you and the sins of me. You guys, let us not forsake the opportunities we get to celebrate what God has done in our lives and to celebrate what God is doing in each of our lives because we're in good company. Because if you remember, at the beginning of chapter 15, it talks about even the heavenly angels celebrate with us. God is up to, up to something, you guys, and let us look in the mirror, let's pay attention and let's take time to really meditate on what God has done for us when he sent Jesus Christ to die on the cross for our sins and he rose again and continues to pursue us, continues to pursue us. Let's pray together. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your loving kindness, your covenant that Lord, you will pull out all stops to search for us You will leave 99 that think they don't need you to go after one. You will turn on the lamp and sweep out the hut to look for that lost coin. You will also just sit and wait by the window as some of us have broken your heart as we rebel against you. And some of us are actually right here thinking that we're okay, but we're full of Phariseeism. Father, forgive us for this stuff. We know that we bring nothing to the table, but Lord, we come as empty vessels realizing that we humbly come and accept the gift that you give us, a relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Heavenly Father, I want to add too that I know that you're really um, interested in, in each of our lives. Lately, even our last board meeting, we had a list of people to pray for. Father, we have folks that are going through marriage difficulties right now. We have folks that are going through uh, uh, physical ailments. They need to be healed, Lord. They need to be healed. And Lord... We just ask that you would continue to be with our church here in White Rock, but more than that, Lord, the church worldwide, that you would continue to show your power and show your intense love. And I pray that all of us would be guilty of what these sinners and and tax collectors were doing, that we would actually lean in and we would listen for your still small voice and we would respond 
to the great love of God. Thank you for your care. We continue to worship you in the name of Jesus. Amen. Your love and kindness to 
worse still. 